Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is Shabbat service for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. Welcome, everyone. We pray that this Shabbat is a blessing to each and every one of you who are participating with us. And for those who will listen much later on the archives, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. And it is Saturday, October 30th, 2021, on the Gregorian calendar. And on the Hebrew calendar, it is Kasvan. 24, the year 5782. This is our last Shabbat service for the month of October. Um, of course, then uh, next next week, actually, we begin the month of Kislev, actually before our next Shabbat service. So we're going to have, uh, what we usually do is we do Holy Communion um, when we bring on the, the new Hebrew month. Um, and then also the first Shabbat of the Gregorian calendar month, the first Saturday, we have Holy Communion. So we're going to have Holy Communion pretty close together um, next week. So if you miss one, you can certainly pick up on the other um, and be blessed um, by coming to the table of the Lord. So that um, as far as the announcements goes, that's coming up. We are continuing also um, with our Bible study. We are in the Brit Kadasha, and we're we're pretty far into the Brit Kadasha. We're we're getting um, close to the end of um, this version of the Bible. Uh, we have been going through the Messianic Jewish Family Bible Tree of Life version, the TLV, and in this upcoming week. We will be um, doing the book of Titus, which is three chapters long, and also the book of Philemon, which is just one chapter, actually. And that is what's coming up for this coming week. Tuesday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we meet live in real time on our free conference call.com channel. Everyone is welcome to come join us. Um, and um, we meet to fellowship, lift each other up. We lift each other up in prayer and bring prayer requests um, on Tuesday evenings. Um, and we've been doing spiritual warfare. Uh, we talk about um, the current events and how they uh, reflect on the times that we're living on, you know, in um, without censorship. So we can certainly just have have open discussion. Um, and our free speech is not infringed upon. So come and join us on Tuesday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We, you can join by phone, you can join by web, and you can join by Wi-Fi data. And um, there are links. I do post to GabUSA.life and MeWe and Facebook. So there are links. Um, to the phone, uh, to the phone connections. There are 76 countries that have free access. That drop-down menu is our free access. So even even the USA number says it's a toll number, but it is not. No one has ever paid to come on. So um, you just have to follow whatever your country's number is, the international number, and then add the access code. So that makes it free. Um, and um, if you choose to come on on the web, there is a built-in microphone there. Um, just follow the prompts. It is safe to download the app. It's safe to uh, also download the web um, application as well. So um, I've used it for college classes for numerous years. So absolutely come join us. We would love to have you. So that is really all the announcements I have for this week. Um, we're going to open up Shabbat service now with our opening prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come in and take over and lead us and guide us and teach us. Avina Malkino, our Father, our King, we thank you. We thank you first and foremost for the breath that you have provided in our lungs today. That breath comes from you. You are the giver of life. You are the creator of all things. We love you, Father God, and we thank you. We 
worship you. We honor you and praise you and glorify you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit come and guide us, and lead us, and teach us, and open the eyes of our hearts, ears of our heart, that we may be open to what it is that you want us to grasp from the service today. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for your presence. We love being in the presence of you, Father God. We love your blessing upon each and every one of us as we love you. Help us to grasp what it is that you want us to know. Help us to walk close with you in these days that are so trying. We need you, Father God. We need you more than ever before. We've always needed you, but we really need you now. We need to know and feel your presence with us each and every moment of our life. We thank you for all that you've done for us, for sending us your one and only begotten Son who made the opportunity for us to get right with you and reconcile with you. We thank you so much for that. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. And this is Shabbat. This is the day that the Lord has made and sanctified as holy. It is Saturday. It is Sabbath. It is the seventh day. And if you go with me now to Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 8, it says, and this is one of the Ten Commandments, or also known as the Ten Words. Remember Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work. The seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it, you shall not do any work, not you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. Amen. Amen. So go with me now also. We are going to begin with the greatest commandment of all. And Yeshua also stated that. So let's say with me now. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kibod, Nahuto Le'alam Vayad. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you can follow along in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, find them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And Yeshua added the second greatest commandment, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Amidah, standing before God, we're going to say, Three of the, the blessings. The first blessing is the patriarchs. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, God most high, who bestows loving kindness and creates all who remembers the kindnesses of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their descendants for the sake of his name and love and helper. Savior and shield, blessed are you, Adonai, shield of Abraham. The second blessing is God's might. You are mighty forever, Lord, giving life to the dead. Great is your saving power. He sustains the living with steadfast love and with great compassion gives life to the dead. He upholds the fallen, heals the sick, sets the captives free, and keeps faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, Master of Might? And who can compare with you, O King? 
who brings death, restores life, and causes salvation to flourish. You are faithful to revive the dead. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives life to the dead. And the third blessing is holiness, Kedusha. You are holy and your name is holy. And holy ones praise you every day. Blessed are you, Adonai, the holy God. Matavu, how lovely. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel. Because of your great loving kindness, I will bow down towards your holy temple in awe of you. And I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. As for me, I will bow in worship. I will kneel before Adonai, my maker. As for me, my prayer to you, Adonai, is for a time of favor. O God, in your great love, answer me with the truth of your salvation. And ex Cain, the tree of life declaration, we say this of the Torah. It is a tree of life to those who grasp it, and happy are those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are shalom. Bring us back to you, Adonai, and we will return. Renew our days as of old. By Yom Rahu in that day. And it is said, Adonai will then be king over all the earth. In that day, Adonai will be a God, and his name a God. May God's great name be magnified and sanctified. Amen. In the world that he created by his will. And may he establish his kingdom, cause salvation to sprout. And may he bring the Messiah closer, amen, in your lifetime and in your days and within the lifetime of the entire house of Israel. Speedily and soon and say, amen. May his great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, uplifted and honored be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he who is beyond all blessing and song, praise and consolation spoken in the world and say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his heights make peace upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. And the blessing of Messiah, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan, Lanu Devar HaKayim Mashiach Yeshua. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of life, Messiah, Yeshua. Say with me now, Messiah's prayer. Our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And in the ancient days, the high priests sounded the shofar to gather Benaiah Israel to gather for worship. And we're going to sound the shofar now. I'm going to pause it now for you to go ahead and listen to some highly anointed praise and worship music. We cannot include this in the upload. However, praise and worship is extremely important. We need to give praise and honor and glory and sing to our Father in heaven. It's a very important thing, and we'll be doing that in heaven. So um, it's a beautiful thing to do and very powerful. One of the most important important elements of worship. Having a little problem with the upload here. I'm hoping when we come back from praise and worship um, that it will settle down. So go ahead and um, listen to some praise and worship and we're going to come back and begin with the Torah portion. Well, we are going to be covering Parashat Kaye. Sarah, which means Sarah's life. 
And this is the Torah portion for this week. It is Genesis chapter 23, verse 1 through chapter 25, verse 18. And we're going to begin that now. Parashat Kaye, Sarah, Abraham purchases Mount Machpelah, and that is spelled M-A-C-H-P-E-L-A-H. Now, Sarah's life was 127 years, the years of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose before his his dead one and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am an outsider and a sojourner among you. Give me a gravesite among you so that I may bury my dead from before my presence. The sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Listen to us, my lord. You are a prince of God of, among us. Bury your dead in the best of our graves. None among us will withhold his grave from you to bury your dead one. Then Abraham got up and bowed down to the people of the land, to the sons of Heth, and spoke with them, saying, If you are of a mind to let me bury my dead from before my presence, listen to me. Plead with Ephron, son of Zophar, on my behalf, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah that belongs to him, that is at the end of his field. At the full price, let him give it to me in your midst for a gravesite. Now Ephron was sitting in the midst of the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham, in the ears of the son of Heth, all those who enter the gate of his city, saying, No, my lord, listen to me, the field, I hereby give it to you, also the cave that is in it, I hereby give it to you. In the eyes of the sons of my people, I hereby give it to you. Bury your dead one. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land and spoke to Ephron in the ears of the people of the land, saying, But if only you would please listen to me, I hereby give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead one there. So Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me, a land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between me and you? Bury your dead one. Abraham heard Ephron. So Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver that he had spoken of in the ears of the son of Heth. 400 shekels of silver at the merchant's rate. Now Ephron's field that is in Machpelah next to Mamre, the field of the cave that is in it, and all the trees that are in the field in all its surrounding territory, was handed over to Abraham as a purchase possession in the eyes of the sons of Heth before all those who enter the gate of his city. Afterward, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, next to Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that was in it were handed over to Abraham as a gravesite from the sons of Heth. And chapter 24, Courting of Rebecca. Now Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Adonai blessed Abraham in everything. Then Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who managed everything that belonged to him, Now put your hand under my thigh, so that I may make you take an oath by Adonai, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am dwelling. And this is the way they, they took an oath. On the contrary to my land and to my relatives, you must go and get a wife for my son Isaac. But the servant said to him, Suppose the woman were unwilling to follow after me to this land. Should I then have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham said to him, See to it that you don't return my son there. Adonai, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, and from my native land, and who spoke to me and made a pledge to me, saying, To your seed I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. If the woman is not willing to follow after you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Nevertheless, you must not return my son there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, 
and he made a pledge to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left with all the best of his master's things in his hand. Then he arose and went to Aram, Naharim, Naharim, to Nahor's city. Then he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time for the going out to draw water. Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master, he said, please make something happen before me today and show loyalty to Abraham, my master. Look, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are going out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please tip your jar so that I may drink and she will say, drink, and I'll also water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So by this I'll know that you have shown graciousness to my master. Now before he had finished speaking, behold, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, going out with her jar on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very good-looking, a girl of marriageable age, and she was a virgin. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me sip a little water from your jar. So she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar onto her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll also draw water for your camels until they finish drinking. So she quickly poured out her jug into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew water for all his camels while the man continued to pay close attention to her, keeping silent in order to know whether or not Adonai had made his way successful. Now after the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a nose ring of gold, weighing a half shekel and two bracelets on her hands, weighing ten shekels of gold. Whose daughter are you? he said. Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She also said to him, There is both straw and plenty of feed with us, as well as room to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshipped Adonai, and he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loyalty and his truth toward my master. As for me, Adonai has guided me in the way to the house of of my master's brothers. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's house uh, these things. Now Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban, and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. As soon as he saw the, the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's hand, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister saying, Thus the man said to me, he went to the man. There he was standing by the camels at the spring, so he said, Come in blessed of adonai why are you standing outside when i've tidied up the house and there is room for the camels so the man came to the house and he unloaded the camels straw and feed were given to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him food was placed before him to eat but he said i won't eat until i've stated my business so he said speak I am Abraham's servant, he said. Adonai has blessed my master very much, so that he has become great, and he has given to him flocks of sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male slaves and female slaves, camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, gave birth to a son for my master after she was old, and he gave him everything he owns. Then my master made me take an oath, saying, you must, you must not take a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites, to whose land I am dwelling. Instead, you must go to my father's house and to my, my family and take a wife for my son. But I said to my master, suppose the woman won't come back with me. So he said to me, Adonai, before whom I walk continually, will send his angel with you and he will make your way successful. And you will take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's household, then you'll be free from my oath. If you come to my family and if they don't give her to you, then you'll be free from my oath. So I came today to the spring and I said, Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master, if you are really going to make my way upon which I am walking successful, look, I'm standing by the spring of water. So let it be that the unmarried girl 
who is going out to draw water to whom I'll say, please give me a little water to drink from your jug. And she'll say to me, you drink and I'll, I'll also draw water for your camels. Let her be the woman whom Adonai appoints for my master's son. I had not yet finished speaking to my heart. And behold, there was Rebecca going out. Her jug was on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. So I said to her, please, give me a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug off of her and said, drink, and I'll also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk aboard to him. Then I placed the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her hands. I bowed down and worshipped Adonai, and blessed Adonai, the God of my master Abraham, who guided me on the true way to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. So now, if you're really going to show loyalty and truth to my master, tell me. But if not, tell me, and I'll turn to the right or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, and they said, The matter proceeds from Adonai. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Rebecca is before her, before you. Take her and go, and let her become a wife for our master's son, just as, as Adonai has spoken. Now when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed down to the ground to Adonai. Then the servant brought out articles of silver and golden garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave precious gifts to her brothers and to her mother. And then they ate and drank, he and the men who were with him, and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me off to my master. But her brother with her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days or 10 after she may go afterwards. But he said to them, don't delay me since Adonai has made my way successful. Send me off so that I can get go to my master. So they said, we'll call the young woman and let's ask her opinion. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca, their sister, off with, with her nanny and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your seed possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebecca got up with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed after the man. So the servant took Rebecca and departed. Now Isaac had come from visiting Berlaharoi Ber and was living in the land of Negev. Isaac went out to meditate, strolling in the field at dusk. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw, behold, camels were coming. Rebecca also lifted up her eyes and saw Isaac, Then she fell off her camel. Then she said to the servant, Who is that man there who is walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, He is my master. So she took the veil and covered herself. Then the servant recounted to Isaac all the things he had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, to Rebekah, and became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after the loss of his mother. Abraham's old age and descendants. This is the beginning of chapter 25. Now Abraham took another wife, her name Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, and Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. Dedan's sons were Ashoram, Ledeshem, and Lumim. And Midian's sons were Ephah, Ephor, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All of these were Keturah's sons. Now Abraham gave everything that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of Abraham's concubines, Abraham had given gifts and sent them away from his son Isaac while he was still living eastward to the land of the east. Now these are the days of the years of Abraham's life that he lived 175 years. So Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, and satisfied. Then he was gathered to his peoples. Then Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of, of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, next to Mamre, the field that Abraham 
but from the sons of Heth. There, Abraham is buried along with Sarah, his wife. After Abraham's death, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac lived near Bir Laharoi. And that is spelled B-E-E-R hyphen L-A-H-A-I hyphen R-O-I. Now, these are the genealogies of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian slave girl, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their descendants. Ishmael's firstborn, Nebaoth, then Kedar, Ab Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedim. These are Ishmael's sons, and these are their names by their unwalled and walled settlements, twelve princes according to their clans. These are the years of Ishmael's life, 137 years. He breathed his last, died, and was gathered to his peoples. Then they dwelled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria, over against all his brothers he fell. And that's the end of the Torah portion for this week, and we're going to recap that. Um, there was a lot that happened here. And we open up here with. Um, Abraham um, purchasing a burial plot, basically, uh, for the family. Sarah passed away at 127 years at Kiriath Arba, which is in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So Abraham mourned his wife and wept over her, but then he needed to, um, to bury her, and he, he paid for that piece of land, that the cave of Machpelah, um, even though... Um, they were going to give it to him for free. He said no. So he paid the, the price of 400 shekels of silver and buried Sarah. Oh, I'm having a little bit of a, I'm hoping, it's only saying 15 minutes here. So I am actually hoping I should be longer than 15 minutes that is uploaded. So I'm hoping I didn't lose anything here. Uh, but we're doing the recap of the Torah portion at this point. So Sarah passed away um, and um, Abraham purchased at full price 400, for 400 shekels of silver uh, the cave of Machpelah and um, near Mamre, uh, so the area around that as well. So at this point, you know, we're, we're looking at Sarah's life and, and, you know, that it had, you know, Abraham was mourning the loss of her life because she had come to the end of her life. So um, it's only when we face that certainty of physical death that we can be comforted by the truth that heaven is our true home because of Yeshua. So we have, we have that to look forward to. So after, um, after Abraham had dealt with all of that, um, he then sent his, his servant to get a wife for Isaac. Um, and as we see, Isaac, uh, the, the, the wife was chosen for him was um, from, it, it was a relative, actually, um, and this would be Rebecca. Um, Abraham was very clear that he did not want him to take a wife out of um, any of the Canaanites. Um, Abraham made his servant swear by the Lord God of heaven and earth that he would not take a bride for Isaac from among the Canaanites, who had been cursed by Noah. Now, when you think about, um, you know, um, a lot of, you know, the patriarchs actually, they lived so long that, you know, many of them, there, there were generations of, of, of people that they knew each other. So, um, Abraham's servant, um, found Rebecca. He had prayed to God to reveal Isaac's bride. Uh, by certain things that he would say and she would respond 
And indeed, um, it was Rebecca who came and um, came out and he approached her and asked her for a drink. And she responded in, in exactly the manner that he asked would be a sign. So, um, so it ends up that it is Rebecca um, for Isaac. And we're going to learn a little bit more about Laban and we can see that he was already trying when we, when, when we um, get into the story of Joseph. Um, because Laban actually is not very, very uh, honest in dealing with Joseph. We're going to see that in the future. And he was he was kind of starting that with the 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 servant to Abraham, uh, trying to well, she needs to stay, you know, stay 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 for a day or maybe even ten, and then we'll let her go. Well, he caught on to that and said, no, you know, Adonai has made the way clear. Do not delay me. And then they said, well, we'll, we'll ask Rebecca if she will go with. And she did say she would go. She did not shrink back in fear. She was bold and courageous. And she had a really good character, you know, about her. So she went along and, um, as they were approaching and she saw Isaac, Isaac saw her, she put a veil over her face. She was promised Isaac. And that, that is a custom, actually. That was a, an old custom when someone, when a woman was promised to, uh, to prior to marrying, um, and they were, they were promised to, to a husband, um, they covered their face. That meant that that all others hands off, basically. Um, that sh this woman is no longer available. She's no longer free to court or date anyone else, so to speak. That's kind of the, the, the best way I can describe that. So she made that clear right then and there that, okay, she was taken, in other words. And then um, they got married, and and Rebecca was very brave, you know, um, to just, she followed, she trusted. And sometimes the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, will take us out of our comfort zone, our familiar home, and ask us to follow him to a place that he will show us. And Abraham exemplified that uh, when he left his home, and, you know, God, he, he trusted in God. So actually, you know, Rebecca was very trusting and in going with this servant of Abraham. So to speak a little bit about Sarah, too. Uh, we know that Sarah was 127 years um, when she passed. Um, and again, the parasha, um, the Torah uh, the life of Sarah, Kaye Sarah, um, initially focused on her death. Um, Sarah is the only woman in the Bible to have a parasha, parasha named after her. I, and so that's really an honor. All the other parashats are men, ba Balak, Pinkas, Korah, Korak, Noach, and Yitro. Um, so it underscores how important this matriarch Sarah is to our faith. Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, and her funeral is the first to be recorded in the Torah. She is buried in the tomb of the patriarchs at Machpelah, the second holiest place in, you know, after the Temple Mount. The burial place in which the fathers and mothers of the Jewish faith are buried is located in Hebron. In Parashat Kaye Sarah, Abraham purchases, as we as we read, this land for the full asking price. Sarah's obedience is rewarded. Um, we saw um, the ultimate test, you know, too last week um, with Isaac. God provided the ram for the sacrifice, and one must wonder what went through Sarah's mind. Uh, did she even know? for what purpose Abraham departed with their son. Did she worry that her
her joy, her reason for laughter, Isaac, may not return home alive to her. So we do read in the Brit Kadasha about Sarah's radical obedience to her husband as an example of faith and courage that women of God are encouraged to em emulate. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They, they submitted them, themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. Yet uh, you are her daughters. If you do what is right, do give way to fear. Now that's in, in First Peter. Sarah demonstrated um, her loyalty to her husband. You know, when he said, call yourself my sister, you know, and, and that happened twice um, to save his life. Uh, she did not dishonor him. She, she did what he asked her to do. Um, and then, you know, when she gave birth to her only son, um, she didn't know where Abraham, where they were going um, and what was going to happen. Like I, I mentioned twice, she entered a foreign king's harem, um, and God did uh, protect her and rescued her from both the Pharaoh and King Abimelech's har harems. And it was God who did not allow um, her to be touched by either one of them. So, um, but Sarah did as Abraham um, had asked, and she may not have tr trusted her imperfect husband who was willing to sacrifice his own wife to save his own skin, but she trusted God to protect and preserve her from all evil. Now, um, the, the incident where uh, the lack of faith came uh, with the child that was promised, and she gave her servant Hagar to Abraham in order to raise up children for him, um, Sarah was convinced that God would be true to his promise to bring forth nations through Abraham, but she thought she was too old for that. Hagar was not just any servant either. Uh, Sarah personally trained her in faith. And moreover, it's quite possible that Hagar could have been the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. The fact that Hagar conceived and Sarah did not caused Hagar to think that she was more spiritual and therefore more blessed than Sarah. And in her pride, she exalted herself over Sarah. Well, that was a bad, a bad thing to do. Um, so when the three, when they were visited by the three men, the three angels visited Abraham. Sarah then understood that the child of promise would indeed come through her. And Sarah's giving birth to Isaac in her old age shows us that we are not expected to just idly sit, you know, and, you know, in our rocking chairs as we become elderly, but we can remain vital and active even in our latter years. Both Abraham and Sarah achieved significant accomplishments, not in their youth, but in the last years of their life. This is in keeping with an old, you know, an old saying: "At forty, one is fit for discernment; at fifty, for counsel; at eighty, for special strength." Now, if we think about Caleb and Joshua in the Promised Land, I mean, whew, what a warrior! I mean, what warriors they were! They were fighting giants in their eighties. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, so. Anyway, you know, and, and what Caleb said, and now I am here this day, 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. They were tough. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to her son, Isaac, and then um, she died at 127 years old. And those 37 years were some of the best years of Sarah's life as she raised the child that she and Abraham had hoped and prayed for most of their adult life. And the Torah showed Sarah as her husband's partner in life and his equal. Um, they were both 
considered to have been excellent teachers in their own right was Sarah teaching the women and Abraham teaching the men. She completely shared Abraham's journey with God in a spirit of faith, courage, and if necessary, self-sacrifice. She endured being uprooted from her native land, being barren, considered a curse in the Middle Eastern culture, until the age of 90, being held captive and being exposed to the advances of foreign kings twice. Through it all, she remained faithful to God, to her husband, and to her calling. Obviously, Sarah was a beautiful woman, so beautiful, in fact, that Abraham resorted to calling her his sister to protect himself from the gangs of marauding soldiers who might be tempted to kill him in order to take his to take his wife, even though Sarah was, in fact, his half-sister. That was true. They both shared the same father. They still did not justify the deception that put his wife's honor at risk. How did Sarah endure so many difficult trials in her lifetime? It was through her optimism and inner tranquility that comes only with faith in God that Sarah was able to deal with such adversity. This was likely part of her appeal and power. And the Bible tells us that we have need of endurance also. In Hebrews um, 10, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Who can find a virtuous woman for her worth is far above rubies? And this is what King Solomon said. The heart of her husband safely and trust, safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain. And that's in Proverbs 31, 10 to 11. It has often been said that behind every great man is a great woman. Sarah takes this one step further. She is the biblical model of the godly woman behind the godly man. And so uh, she showed herself to be the great woman who helped ensure the successful continuation of Abraham's dynasty. So the life of Sarah is not about her death, therefore about her legacy. Abraham ensures that her legacy continues by setting in motion the finding of a wife for Isaac. For that reason, as this parashat continues, the story becomes more about Isaac's life and less about Abraham. So without Sarah, Abraham takes leave of the world stage. And then we're moving on to Isaac, and then Isaac and Rebecca. So a good part of this parashat centered on how Abraham's servant located the proper wife for Isaac. And he essentially chose a kind-hearted woman who was capable of decisive, compassionate, godly action. She was a woman who would take the time to help a stranger and his animals. This was Rebecca. And she was also the kind of woman who once she knew God's purposes, would not hesitate to act immediately. And as soon as she knew that God had selected her to be Isaac's wife, she did not let another day pass in fulfilling that destiny, though family members sought to give her an excuse, as, as we saw, to delay her leaving. Abraham's marriage to Sarah and Isaac's marriage to Rebekah reveal that a partner's spiritual qualities are far more important than their physical attributes, although beauty and attention to appearance obviously helps. God does have a plan for us. May we use the wisdom of God to understand that our choice of a life partner will affect how we fulfill our calling and subsequently the legacy that we have. To prepare to leave such a legacy, may we choose partners prayerfully, praying for them even before we meet them. And may we base our decisions about whom we will marry on spiritual qualities, on whether a potential partner possesses the beautiful inner characteristics of God's loving kindness and mercy, grace, selflessness, and benevolence toward all. For those of us, for, for, those, for those who are already married, we can pray as couples that God will use us to accomplish his purposes for those that are married. We can be the kind of partner that helps helps our spouses walk in, in his or her destiny, as well as we should pray that God will give our children a sense of his purpose for their lives. So this is for the single and for the married. God works in, worked in the lives of Abraham and Isaac to bring them a suitable partner through whom 
he would bring forth Israel. This reminds us that God has a grand plan in which the lives of each individual plays a role. He is still working in the same manner that he, he was during the time of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebecca, not only to accomplish his purposes for, for um, these people, but also for each of us. His eye is on every detail of our lives, and he wants us to partner with him in his purposes. It's always good to have God in the center of all of our relationships and in, in our life and what we do in our life. So that is the Torah portion and the recapping of the Torah portion. We are going to now go on to the half Torah. And the half Torah this week, we are going to do um, First Kings, the first chapter, chapters 1, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 53. And I apologize too, I am kind of losing my voice here off and on. It's a little scratchy today. Um, so uh, bear with me as, as I'm going through this. So the half Torah portion, we're going to begin here with First Kings, the first chapter, rivalry for the throne. Now we're going to be talking about, we're going to be here with King David. Now King David was old, advanced in years. Though they covered him with clothes, he could not keep warm. So his servants said to him, let them seek a young virgin for my lord the king and let her attend the king and be his nurse and let her lie by your side so my lord the king may keep warm. So they sought for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. And the girl was very beautiful so she became the king's nurse and served him but the king was not intimate with her. It had nothing to do with intimacy. Now. Adonijah, son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I'll be king. So he prepared for himself chariots, horsemen, and fifty men to run before him. His father had not scolded him at any time by asking, Why have you behaved this way? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. So he conferred with Joab, son of Zerue, and with Abiathar the Kohen, following Adonijah, they supported him. But Zadok, the Kohen, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and David's mighty men were not on Adonijah's side. Then Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle by the stone of Zohaleth, which is beside Enrogel, and invited all, the, all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants, but he did not invite Nathan, the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty men, or Solomon. But Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, saying, Haven't you heard that Adonijah, son of Haggith, has assumed the kingship, and our Lord David doesn't know it? Now come, please, let me give you advice. Save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go at once to King David and say to him, my lord the king, haven't you sworn to your handmaid, saying, Surely your son Solomon will become king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Then why does Adonijah, Adon Adonijah reign? Behold, while you are still there talking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went to the king into the chamber. Now the king was very old with Abishag, the Shunammite, serving the king. Bathsheba bowed and prostrated herself to the king. The king asked, What troubles you? She said to him, My lord, you swore by Adonai your god to your handmaid. Surely Solomon, your son, will be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Yet now, behold, Adonijah reigns. So you do not know it, my lord the king. He has sacrificed oxen, fed and cat cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons. Abiathar, the Kohen, and Joab, the commander of the army, but he has not invited Solomon, your servant. As for you, my lord, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will, it will come to pass, when my lord the king sleeps with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be considered traitors. Then behold, while she was still talking with the king, the prophet Nathan came in, 
And they informed the king, saying, Behold, the prophet Nathan is here. When he came in before the king, he prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground. Then Nathan said, My lord, the king, did you say, Adonijah shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today, slain ox and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons, the captains of the army, and Abiathar the Kohan. And behold, they are eating and drinking with him, and they are saying, Long live King Ad Adonijah. But he did not invite me, your servant Zadok the Kohan, Benai, son of Jehoiada, or your servant Solomon. Was this thing done by, by my lord the king, without letting your servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then King David answered and said, Summon Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. Then the king swore an oath, as Adonai lives, who has redeemed my soul out of all distress, as surely as I swore to you by Adonai, the God of Israel, saying that your son Solomon will be king after me and will sit on my throne in my place, thus I will surely fulfill it this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face on the ground and prostrated herself before the king and said, let my lord King David live forever. Then King David said, Summon to me Zadok the Kohen, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, the king said to him, Take with you the servants of your lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my mule and bring him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the Kohen and Nathan the prophet anoint him as king over Israel, blow the shofar, and say, Long live King Solomon, then you shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place, as I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Kind of like some of the things that's happening today. The anointing never left, number 45. But yet we have an imposter that called himself. But the anointing, the anointing is not on, on that man. And I, I think y'all know what I'm talking about here. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king and said, Amen. Thus says Adonai, the God of my lord, the king. As Adonai has been with my lord, the king, so will he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my lord, King David. So Zadok. The Kohen, Nathan, the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites, and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. Then Zadok, the Kohen, took the horn of oil out of the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the shofar, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. All the people went up after him while the people were playing on the flutes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the ground shook at their noise. Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it just as they finished eating. When Joab heard the sound of the shofar, he said, Why is this city in an uproar? While he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the Kohen, came. And Adonijah said, Come in, for you are a valiant man, and surely bringing good news. But Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, No, for our lord King David has made Solomon king. Also the king has sent with him Zadok the Kohen, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites, and the Pelethites, and they had heard him, they had him ride on the king's mule. Zadok the Kohen and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon. From there they have come up rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. That's the noise that you heard. Also Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Moreover, the king's courtiers came to bless our lord King David, saying, May God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and his throne greater than your throne. Then the king bowed down on the bed. Furthermore, the king said, Blessed be Adonai, God of Israel, who this day has given one to sit on my throne, while my eyes are seeing it. Trembling, all the guests of Adonijah got up, and each went their own way, because they weren't appointed. They weren't, you know, Adonijah wasn't anointed. It wasn't, it wasn't a promise to him. He took it upon himself. He tried to steal the kingship from Solomon. So it was reported to Solomon 
Behold, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon, for look, he grasped the horns of the altar, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I got to back up here. Trembling, all the guests of Adonijah got up and each went his own way. Adonijah was afraid of Solomon, so he arose and went and grasped the horns of the altar. And it was reported to Solomon, Behold, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. For look, he grasped the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with a sword. Then Solomon says, If he shows himself a worthy man, then not a hair of him will fall to the ground. But if wicked, wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. He came and prostrated himself before King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, Go to your home. So that is the end of this week's half Torah. Very interesting, isn't it? Um, so we were we we're also paralleling the death of King David, a very powerful man, um, you know, in, in his time. And he was very blessed of God um, as well. So we're going to recap once more um, the Torah portion and the half Torah portion here. Uh, Sarah died again at age 127, is buried in, in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron which Abraham purchased from Ephron the Hittite for 400, 400, 400 shekels of silver. And Abraham's servant Eleazar then was sent uh, with gifts uh, to find a wife for Isaac. And he found Rebecca. And we went through that whole, uh, that whole story uh, of how he prayed to God to show him who that woman would be by certain things that uh, he would ask her and she would respond. Rebecca is the daughter of Abraham's nephew, Bethuel, Bethuel, appeared at the well and she fit the bill. So he took Rebecca for Isaac and, and then it was Isaac and Rebecca. Abraham took a new wife, Keturah, um, and she father. Uh, she she actually uh, gave him six additional sons, but Isaac is the, the, the designated heir. So Abraham fathered six additional sons afterwards, but again, Isaac was the chosen heir. So Abraham died at 175 years old, was buried beside Sarah by both of his, his the two eldest sons, Isaac and Ishmael. So the half Torah described uh, the aging King David echoing um, again in this week's Torah, you know, with Abraham being old and advancing in days and uh, Sarah and Abraham passing on. King David was aging. And we know Isaac took, took over in that whole line um, after Abraham passed. And now we have Solomon who was to succeed King David. But we see that that was almost stolen from him. <laughs> and, you know, almost, well, actually, Adonijah took it upon himself. And, and as we know the story, the Absalom tried to steal the throne as well. So um, here we have another brother trying to steal the, the throne. And, and it was promised to Solomon. And it was given to Solomon. So, and Nathan, actually the prophet Nathan came to Bathsheba and basically said, hey, look, this is, you know, Adon Adonijah just proclaimed himself king and he is, they're partying and they, 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 they sacrifice, they're eating, they're, they're making merry and um, this is not what was supposed to happen. You need to go before the king and let him know that this was done behind his back. And she did so and he backed her up. And King David proclaimed what he promised and then gave orders for um, Solomon to be anointed as king while he was still alive. So, and then word came back to Adonijah and, and all those that were involved in that. And they were like, oh, we're out of here. Um, because they knew that they weren't supposed to do that. They took that upon themselves, which was not a good thing. 
So um, that is the end of our first segment. We're gonna take we're gonna say a prayer and take a short break and come back with the Brit Kadasha. I just want to say, um, as we talked about, you know, Sarah's life, we talked about the importance, you know, and when God chooses, you know, God chooses someone to do, you know, a specific thing, like Abraham was chosen um, to be the line that would be given the promised land, the seed would be uh, multiplied, his seed would be multiplied. God made that promise clear, but he also had the promised son already in mind, and that was Isaac. So it was never Ishmael, um, and Sarah kind of uh, went a little bit ahead of herself there, um, and then Hagar got a little haughty with uh, Sarah, thinking that she was better than Sarah, more spiritual than Sarah. And, um, well, that didn't fare out too well. Um, Sarah actually had them removed from the community because Isaac was the chosen heir. And then we look to the half Torah where um, one of David's other sons tried to, to kind of push Solomon aside when, when he was the chosen heir to be the, the next king by David. And... Um, and that was definitely approved by God. So Adonijah actually took it upon himself. And it wasn't in his place to do so. So God has callings for each and every one of us. I mean, if we we're going against what God wants us to do, it, it doesn't usually fare out too well in the end. So, um, Those are two parallels, two specific examples of that in both, you know, the Torah and the half Torah. So we're going to take a quick break and come back with the Brit Kadasha. Then we'll do our altar call and then close Shabbat service for this week. Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word. Your word is so powerful and we can see through the people that you used to demonstrate your word and the mistakes they made, um, the various things they went through and, and, and where you touched their lives and led them and guided them. Um, you never left them or forsake or forsook them. We see that as an example, right from the beginning, you were a friend to Abraham. And Abraham trusted you. Sarah trusted you. That's an example for us. And King David absolutely put all of his trust in you. Um, he leaned on you very heavily in, in, in many of his years when he was running from King Saul. And you delivered him from danger. You never left him or forsook him either. This is a perfect example for us in the days that we're living now. When we look at our world and the chaos and craziness that the world that we live in has come to, you are our rock. You are steady. You're, you are our Father and our God who we can trust and know that you will get us through whatever it is that we need to get through. You're never going to leave us. You're never going to forsake us. And we trust you explicitly. We love you, Father God, for that. We know that you love us because you gave us your one and only son to redeem us so we could be right with you and spend eternity with you. So we know that that is love that we can't even begin to understand. But it's powerful. We love you, Father God. We worship you. We adore you. And there is no one, no one like you. We thank you so much. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Take a short break and we'll come back with the second segment of Shabbat service. Take about a 15-minute break and we'll come back and, and gather again. 